today we have the honor of having Dr. David Fisher from the Software Engineering Institute as our guest. And uh, Dr. Fisher is the author of over 50 papers in the area of software engineering. Today he is uh, going to be talking to us on uh, survivabilities in, in unbounded uh, networks. Uh, survivability is currently a very <coughs> active topic of research in uh, computer science, and uh, he has some very interesting descriptions of how networks should operate, and talked to me about this quite a bit this morning, and uh, I think you're going to learn a different view of uh, denial of service and availability in network systems um, through this lecture. But he has to tell us first uh, about his uh, rendezvous with Alan Funt. Um, <laughs> he and, and Professor Schimmel apparently were captured by Candid Camera uh, today at lunchtime. So uh, without any further hesitation, we'll find out what happened. Yes. Yes. Uh. Yeah, so at lunch today, we, uh, we went to the, uh, was it Hilton? Hilton uh, Hotel right over here, and uh, the, uh, we were, what was the name of it? It was called Mom's uh, something. Mom's Pacific. Mom, Mom's Pacific Restaurant, right. Uh, the Mom's apparently was uh, something that isn't normally there. And Mom met us at the door and said, you know, this was uh, her restaurant and that, uh, you know, had a good time at all this. And we go to the seats and uh, uh, placed our orders and... Uh, and then the mom came around and said, uh, well, uh, particularly to uh, Tim, uh, uh, you, you ordered Hamburg and uh, tried to talk him out of it. <laughs> you know, red meat's a bad idea and all this. She was unsuccessful, right? <laughs> so, so then she found out he had french fries, so she, uh, she did talk him into substituting fruit for his french fries. <laughs> uh, uh, she couldn't do much with me. I had already ordered fruit and no French fries and uh, a turkey instead of a hamburg. But <laughs> uh, it should prove interesting. This was for their uh, Mother's Day uh, show. So uh, maybe you'll see uh, uh, Tim on television one of these days. Exactly the kind of prep you want right before talking. That's right, that's right. I, I, I just viewed this was a typical California experience, right? <laughs> uh, okay, uh, survivability uh, is a uh, area of research and development that has received uh, a lot of attention in just the last few years. Um, and um, primarily, I think, as a result of the uh, increasing concern for uh, infrastructure assurance and for uh, the problems of um, highly distributed applications, including almost any application that we see on the internet. Um, and at least from a technical standpoint, I think the interest is, has arisen in the reason that a separate uh, uh, research community is developing is because the problems that we see there and the potential solutions are uh, in, in many ways a lot different than what we see in traditional uh, uh, multi-level security. Um, some of the problems that we're most concerned with are uh, what in at least some communities is called denial of service. Um, uh, more formally uh, availability and we'll get back to that. Um, also we're very concerned with uh, what we call cascade effects which is I think different than what some of you call cascade effects. This is not cascading between multiple levels of security, but it rather has to do in infrastructure assurance where you're concerned that, uh, say, if you're talking about the electric power grid, that uh, uh, loss of uh, le uh, um, delivery of electricity in one region may lead to, in fact, loss of in, in the next region and, and cascade that way. Uh, or even more importantly, where you get cascades from one infrastructure to another so that a problem in the electric uh, power grid could lead to problems in communication or problems in uh, transportation uh, or vice versa. And we're beginning to see a lot of interdependencies that way now. Okay, so let me start with uh,
survivability. Um, there's been two workshops now that I'm aware of in, in the area of survivability. Uh, one about 18 months ago, one about six months ago. And the first of those was really concerned with just the question of what is survivability? And there was a lot of opinions on what that might be. And uh, the, the definition that came out of that was that survivability is the capability of a system to fulfill its mission uh, in a timely manner in the presence of attacks, failures, or accidents. So we're basically saying uh, attacks, failures, and accidents are going to occur. And often we can't distinguish between them. Uh, but what we're really concerned about is, is fulfilling the mission, the mission of that system. So if that system, for instance, is air traffic control, it says we actually want the airplanes to, to get to their destinations uh, safely because of the action of the air traffic control system. Um, and if you contrast that with security, um, in, in, typically in, in the security world, you're not particularly concerned about the details of the mission. Where here, we, we, we can't even attack the problem. We can't even understand the nature of the problem until we know what the mission is first. And mission, uh, what we mean by mission is uh, basically the requirements of the mission uh, and both the critical functionality but also uh, essential software quality attributes that are to prevail in that system. So performance can be of importance certainly reliability, um, but those are all determined. It isn't, it isn't that there's a, a particular set of software quality attributes that define survivability. It's rather that once you know the mission, uh, that will dictate what qualities are important in that particular mission. And finally, and I essentially alluded to this, that a fundamental assumption that we make is that no individual component of a system is immune from all attacks, uh, accidents, and design errors. That some of the components are going to be compromised. And so the question is, how do you maintain the mission viability in the presence of, of, of compromises? OK. Um, Another characteristic that we think is inherent uh, in, the, in the world of survivability is that the problem space uh, is one of networks. Um, that these problems really have arisen and or at least been recognized uh, in that context. Uh, it's only with the advent of highly distributed systems, with the advent of the internet, that we begin to say survivability is an issue. Um, and the sorts of systems we're talking about are what we call unbounded networks. That is, they are networks, not that they're infinite, <coughs> but rather that um, their boundaries are unknown. Um, in particular, there's an absence of any central administrative control. So if, if, if your system is connected to the internet, for instance, and you're uh, supporting users on your server that are uh, outside of your own local uh, administrative domain. Um, in fact, if it's a useful system, that probably is the case. Uh, then, you, then you're in the, an unbounded network because it says you have to support users who, in fact, you don't know where they're coming from, you don't know what their characteristics are, you don't know whether they can be trusted or not. Um, there's also an absence of global visibility. Uh, if, if, if you're operating, again, in the context of the internet, your system actually doesn't have any knowledge of what the topology of the whole internet is, what, what systems are connected to it. In fact, uh, no one knows the answers to those questions. Even, even internet routers, in fact, do not know what the topology of the internet is. Uh, I keep stepping on this. <laughs> uh, OK. Uh, OK, and again, we, we said this in the previous slide, but the mission objectives are, in fact, objectives that are expressed in terms of functional properties and software quality attributes that are to prevail for the whole system rather than for individual components of the system. 
And in fact, for that reason, the software quality attributes, we typically do not refer to them by that name. That would be what would be used in, typically in, in a single system. Uh, but the term that uh, has certainly become popular in, in unbounded networks is non-functional global properties. But it really is the network view uh, of software quality attributes. Uh, and in fact, what we're really talking about is emergent properties. That is to say that the, the, the properties we want for a system to have, the properties we want the, to prevail for that system if it's fulfilling its mission, are properties that uh, somehow emerge from the computation, from, from the, the total actions of that system. Uh, and uh, just to, to illustrate that, uh, if you look at traditional uh, hierarchical software development, um, the, uh, for instance, I want certain performance in my system. I may build components that have known performances and then compose them in a way that preserves that performance uh, to guarantee that for the total. Um, a lot of software quality attributes, in fact, are of that uh, um, correctness is a good example. If I can prove correctness in my components and I have a composition process that preserves correctness in the composition, then I can prove correctness for the whole system. Um, a lot of the things that we're concerned about in survivability do not have that property. Uh, it's, uh, examples might be um, how you build reliable systems out of unreliable components. Okay. We certainly do that in, in engineering fields. Uh, but but this, this normal hierarchical decomposition isn't going to work anymore. Uh, because we're, uh, we're saying that the components now that we're building out of are known to be unreliable. But what we want to do with them is somehow compose them in a way that the composition will be reliable. And so those, that property of reliability is somehow emerging uh, at a global level uh, by virtue of the way we're doing composition. Um, another area that uh, uh, you can see that in is uh, safety. Uh, safety is, is <laughs> you can sometimes make safe components and you can also make safe systems, but it's not clear that the safety of the system, in fact it's clear it is not uh, a, a consequent of composing safe components in ways that remain safe. But in fact, it's almost a new safety problem at each level of the, of the composition. Um, so in general, we're talking about uh, guaranteeing certain, um, at least stochastically, certain uh, global system properties where we're not assured that they exist in the components. Okay, just, just a couple examples here. Um, certainly internet routing is a, is a good example of a uh, mission uh, in an unbounded network. Uh, and it's, it's an application that exists and has effective solutions today. Um, uh, and it turns out that, that if you look at how routing is actually done, it does, it does have this emergent characteristic that we're talking about. You can't do routing locally. Uh, in fact, if you're familiar with how uh, IP routing works, it is, in fact, one where uh, each node in transferring a message to its all of a destination really only knows where to transfer it uh, for one link of that, and the next link makes the next decision. And one of the properties that that routing algorithm leads to, and I'm talking about what we currently do in the internet, is that uh, you can get cycles. And so your message, in fact, may not get to its destination. There's no guarantee of that in the internet. On the other hand, it's statistically, it's, it, it uh, succeeds enough that we don't, we're not concerned about that. Uh, but there is a count, for instance, in each, each message that says after I've been typically, say, uh, transferred through, uh, what, 32 links or something that uh, will just drop that message. Um, naming service is, is an interesting one because uh, it has the same problem characteristics, but the current solutions we use in the internet are very different. Where the routing solution is, is, is in fact, we think, an example of the, the sorts of solutions we'd like to see. 
uh, naming service is basically a central service. It says there is a central uh, point, maybe some fixed number of them, but, but for, for, for some constant number of them, uh, where you go and find out what the translation from a uh, URL to a, an actual uh, IP number is. And so it's a, very much a centralized solution. We find that uh, inappropriate because it means that that's a, a fixed number of, of, of targets. If you take those out, you've taken out the whole thing. Uh, okay, other examples, and like I say, the, what's been driving a lot of the current work is, is infrastructure assurance. Uh, it's um, um, banking and finance system of the U.S. or the world. It's uh, electric power generation and distribution. It's uh, air traffic control and, in fact, uh, in the extreme free flight. Uh, but transportation systems in general, in fact, we've had a lot of interest from, from the railroad industry uh, in survivability because they recognize that they have significant survivability problems. Um, information warfare, um, and, and basically any highly distributed application, but distributed beyond the point that you have a uh, central administrative control over the whole system. Okay, um, what I thought I'd do is just try to contrast security and survivability a little because I know most of you have uh, had a, a fair amount of uh, uh, work in security area. Um, with with uh, a few caveats, security for the most part has traditionally been concerned with confidentiality uh, and also with integrity but, but not not so much focused on that area, and, and even less so with availability. Uh, in survivability, it's the same set of concerns, but the, the priorities essentially have been, been uh, uh, interchanged. So we're primarily focused on availability, but we still have the concerns for integrity and confidentiality, but, but, but they're not where our focus is. Uh, and one of the things this means is that there's not very much mission dependency in, in the techniques that we use in, in, in confidentiality. You know, uh, you know, the firewall that works for um, one application will work for the next one. Uh, where if we're talking about survivability, uh, because of this mission focus, until we know what your mission is, we don't even know what the goals are. And so it's very much a mission focused uh, approach. Um, also, uh, and different people will give you different lists, but basically we see four major uh, types of remedies that are being used in, in security and survivability. Um, resistance, recognition, recovery, and somebody even had an R word for that one, but I forget what it was. Uh, but, but evolving the system to, to be better at all these things in the future. Um, and in security, we tend to, 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 to use a lot of automation in these first two areas. Uh, recovery has traditionally not been a, a, a major focus in security. Um, and the evolution for in security domain is primarily a, a, a manual sort of thing. Um, in survivability, uh, we're certainly looking for automated resistance. Um, we're not overly concerned with recognition. Uh, partially because of the nature of the problem. It says that we're not going to have time to uh, discover uh, that we've been attacked uh, and come up with a, 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 a countermeasure for that and, and uh, so on. It says we, we're trying to maintain the mission. And so we'd like, in fact, to focus on recovery approaches that don't depend on recognition before we can do recovery. Um, and of course, recognition also uh, often means discovering the cause. And again, it's the same thing. It says we don't have time to uh, do a recovery that's a function of the, of, the, of the cause in most cases. On the other hand, uh, just like in security, uh, we certainly are concerned when it comes to evolution of understanding the nature of causes uh, that are actually occurring. Um, but even here, where 
the, the goals are more on an automated basis than they would be in the security area um, because we're trying to keep a system running continuously uh, during these uh, successful uh, attacks. Successful in the sense that they are successful against components, not against the system as a whole. Uh, by the way, feel free to ask questions. I'm, I'm quite open to that. Um, okay. Um, this has led to a uh, concept of survivability architectures. And uh, some of this works my own, but a lot of it is, is other people actually at uh, CERT Coordination Center. Um, but it's pretty much what you would think from what I said before, that um, critical mission requirements means functionality uh, of the mission and these non-functional global properties that we're talking about. And what that leads us to basically is saying a survivability architecture then has two components. Uh, one is the local state transitions that actually occur at the individual components or nodes of the network. Uh, and the others are the protocols of interactions between them. And there's nothing else there. Um. Okay, so this is not a complete list. It's probably not even a list of the most important security methods, but there was, it was a <laughs> it, it's a list of some of the methods we might use in security. Okay. And certainly firewalls and uh, uh, various authentication mechanisms and encryption itself. Um, intrusion detection might be a viable um, one and uh, certainly control systems. Um, in any case, um, the question is, what are the methods that we would find viable for, for survivability? And the first answer is anything that, that helped in security is probably going to help us in some aspects of survivability. And so all those become legitimate survivability methods. The, the, the point is, though, that even with uh, very effective technologies in all of these areas, we're not going to be able to guarantee a survivable system. And so what are the, the, the survivability specific uh, approaches? And redundancy is certainly one of them. Um, not a very effective one either, uh, but it basically says if, if I have n copies, then you're going to have to take out n before you can take out that, that functionality or that uh, database component or whatever it was. Uh, but the more powerful one is, is diversity. When we look at incidents on the internet, for instance, um, in fact, the way, way CERT defines internet instances today, it's not the number of systems that were attacked. It's the, um, the number of independent attacks that took place. And that means that each incident that we report at CERT is typically involves hundreds or thousands of sites that were attacked in a single incident. And the reason that happens is that they have, the attackers typically use automated tools which allow them to perpetuate the same attack against systems that turn out to be identical with regard to that vulnerability. And so if, if their attack is successful against one site, then it's successful against a thousand sites. Well, how do, you, how do you combat that? And the answer is diversity. If each site, in fact, has unique characteristics and therefore unique vulnerabilities, or at least vulnerabilities uh, in different places, and different procedures are required to, to, to uh, compromise the system through that vulnerability, uh, then, then you've got a, 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 a more effective means of, of resistance. Um, you might think about that with regard to uh, the, I understand, fairly recent Navy decision to use NT. Uh, this says nothing about whether NT has good security or bad security. It, it only says that if everything's the same, uh, the, the, the attack is easier. Um, and in fact, if you, if you think about it, um, 
in traditional security, the, the ultimate measure was always can you perpetuate an attack in a way that, uh, I'm sorry, can you, can you guard against an attack in a way that the uh, cost to the intruder exceeds the value they get from, from being successful? And it's the same thing here. And diversity makes it much more expensive for the attacker because they only get to one component. Um, now, that's not quite true. It's true if you don't have cascade effects. And so I'm going to say they don't have cascade effects. See. Cascade effect basically says if I can, if I can uh, find one hole, I can then propagate that throughout the system. I can cause the whole system to fail because I got in. And if your, if your system, if your only protection is, is, is a fortress approach, it says I got a firewall around this, and it's a very good firewall, and it's really hard to get through, uh, that's all fine until uh, somebody compromises it. But if they compromise it anywhere, uh, then if you don't have multiple layers of firewalls uh, or protections of some kind, uh, once there's a break anywhere, it's, it's a break everywhere. And so the, it isn't just a matter of having diversity, but making sure that the compromise of a component does not lead to compromises of its neighbors. Hey, hey. Um, what else? Um, yeah, and again, if we're, if we're talking about unbounded systems, uh, it uh, allows us to talk about how many components do you have to compromise before you compromise the mission? And at least in a, in a formal aspect, what we like to say is that the, uh, we would like solutions that guarantee survival of the mission uh, if the number of compromised components is less than proportional to the total number of components in the system. So if I have the internet with, with n nodes on the internet, and I have a highly distributed application there, I would like that at least the compromised components has to be proportional to n before I get a, a, a failure. A failure in the, in, in the sense of the mission failed. Uh, and for those of you who care about these things, we actually do allow uh, functions of the log <laughs> of the number of nodes, and not just a constant number. Um, trust validation. Uh, so much of security is based on trust. Um, it's, you know, and, and, and in the extreme, it says that uh, the world is divided into two classes, trusted insiders and untrusted uh, outsiders. And I've got this, this barrier that separates them. Um, and that certainly was the model on which the ARPANET was defined. It said everybody that uses the ARPANET is a trusted insider. Uh, university researchers, ARPA community researchers, uh, who all have the same desires and goals and so on. Uh, well, unfortunately, we now have the internet on that model. Uh, and all at once, everybody's an insider, no matter how much they're trusted. Uh, and it's a, I think it's an inherent problem uh, in the world we live in. <coughs> uh, if you're a, a, a banker, you, need, you really do need to allow your customers into your bank, uh, your, uh, your, your suppliers, uh, um, your partners, and of course your competitors are in all of those categories. And so there really isn't this distinction and the, is this, this whole question of trust uh, becomes, I think, has to become a fairly local phenomenon. Um, we certainly have to have trust. We can't do anything without trust. But there's the question of when, when, do you, when do you develop trust? And what we're arguing is that you probably need to validate trust locally on a continuous basis. Um, Self-repair. Um, I think that is just consistent with all the things we've been saying before, that if we assume that components of the system are going to be compromised, uh, then we have to prepare them, and we most desirably, even if we're not sure they're, they're damaged, and, and uh, certainly if we can discover that they're damaged, to, to do that. Um, and finally, and this is my own area of research, um, we have a 
somewhat radical approach to, to solving problems at this time called emergent algorithms. And it basically, it's not the algorithms that are emerging, of course. It's, the, it's algorithms uh, which create <coughs> emergent properties. And in fact, it's algorithms that are defined in terms of the terminologies we were talking about for um, survivability architectures. That is to say, when we describe one of these algorithms, we actually describe the local state transitions and we describe the protocols of interaction. And that constitutes the, the algorithmic definition. But what we want to prove uh, results from that is certain emergent properties of the system as a whole. So you're actually doing algorithmic-based proofs? Uh, <laughs> uh, or you're interested in doing proofs? Well, I don't know who would accept our proofs at this point. Uh, I mean, the truth is we're, we're, we're still feeling in the dark a lot here. We've got intuitions about what would work. We've got a few examples. We have, as some of you know, a, an algorithm that actually does internet routing. Uh, and we can certainly prove that it works. And probably in, we have a proof that I think most people here would accept. Uh, but once we start assuming malicious uh, intruders, is once we start assuming that uh, some number of nodes are compromised, I'm not sure that we have a, an acceptable proof at this point. And worse than that, we don't have any demonstration of these things. That is, we, we haven't been actually able to test any of these emergent algorithms. Um, and, and Tim, you're particularly aware of that because you were helping with that problem last summer. And so I will come back to that in a few minutes. Yes? Well, I think it's premature. I mean, I, that, I mean we wouldn't be doing it at all if we didn't have that, that class of problem in mind. Okay, that is exactly the class of problem that we're concerned about. On the other hand, this is a technology that's so early that you know, talking to actual practitioners about applying it uh, just doesn't make any sense right now. Uh, I'm, I, I couldn't hear you. Well, yeah, some of them. Uh, although not much. I mean, that's, that's, that's really the point here, is that uh, in terms of actual applications, um, everybody says we got the problem, but I don't know anybody that's actually doing anything. In fact, the, the last workshop we had on survivability, the second one, uh, was actually a very interesting meeting because we had senior researchers in the survivability area from all over the world, but the other half of the uh, workshop was people who were actually infrastructure providers. We had vice president of a railroad there, and we had a vice president of the electric power distribution company for a southeastern uh, portion of the U.S. Um, and they are very aware of the problems, uh, but we couldn't pull something out at this time and say, here's a solution to your problem. Um, uh, in fact, control theory is, is <coughs> a control system which kind of monitors what's going on in those systems, oversees it, is, is one of the applications that's being, one of the solutions that's being tried right now. Um, and it's probably going to help. Uh, but if you think about that, that couldn't possibly be the, 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 the final answer because the control system itself is a single point of failure. And in fact, compromising the control system may be a way of compromising the system as a whole, even if he didn't, weren't able to, to uh, otherwise uh, compromise any components of the system. So the answer is not yet. Yeah. 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 Infection in the human body, we know it's an infection because it doesn't identify it. yeah. it's part of us, the inside, it trusted, whatever. Right. And then yet the, the typical response to the, by the consumer to this is, that's my privacy. I don't want to be identified. Uh, I'm worried about comment on that. I mean, well, I, I don't, I don't, when, when, when I talk about trust validation, I am really, I, I think that, you can't depend on central databases. You can't depend on anything that's centralized, basically. Uh, and so it really does become a, a local issue. It says that if you're my neighbor in this network, 
whether it's a physical network, or, I mean, a network of physical uh, entities like people, or whether it's a, a communications network. Uh, if you're my neighbor and I deal with you, I have protocols for interchange with you, uh, and I'm doing my thing and you're doing your thing, and I'm assuming that you probably have the same global desires that I do, uh, trust validation becomes a question of um, the things I observe about you, do they appear to be consistent with our common global goals? Are you doing things that help me do my job? Uh, do you appreciate the things that I provide to you, the informations that help you do your job better? Um, but it's a very local phenomena, and it says, you know, in the, it's the way we operate in everyday life. Um, you know, how do you interact with your fellow students? Which students do you trust and which don't you? It's, it's, it's a very local decision on your part, and it can change based on uh, uh, new reactions from, from, from your neighbor. I don't know if that helped or not, but it's certainly where we're coming from. If you want to take that further, what's the first thing they ask of the mass murderers? They go to his neighbor and say, you seem like a nice guy to me. Right. Uh, right. So we've got some, some problems with that approach, too. It can't be totally local. Right? Ah, but, but that, that's really the point here, is that, that none of this is absolute. And, and all, well, you can't know who the mass murderer is as long as they haven't murdered anybody. <laughs> uh, and it's the sort of thing, if there's a rogue, in your military system, let's say, uh, um, a, a electronic warfare system, and there's a rogue in there, uh, a Trojan horse, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and in order to, to hide its existence, it does things that actually help the mission. Then that's perfectly good. You got the help, you see. So there's no reason not to trust them in some sense, in a, in a very pragmatic sense. Uh, it's when they start doing things that um, you don't like that you that you got a problem, and that's when you got to you got to drop your trust level. And whether you can detect those, maybe you can, maybe you can't. Which is why we get back to immersion algorithms, which says that even if you don't detect them, if there aren't too many of them, you want to guarantee that you're still going to have mission survivability. Okay, um, just just some views of immersion algorithms. Uh, and these are, none of these are complete views, but they, they, they basically enumerate some of the uh, earlier classes of algorithms and approaches that, uh, that you might think are the same as emergent algorithms. So they have some overlap with each of these. Um, certainly our definition is that um, we're talking about producing emergent properties that exist globally but not necessarily locally. So that's kind of our definition. Uh, but there's a whole field of self-stabilizing algorithms around that relates closely to this, and there's certainly techniques we hope we can borrow from there. Um, and what they're talking about is you get convergence uh, and uh, of the functionality of non-global uh, properties uh, even when you have some corruption. So that's kind of the, the, the defining characteristic of uh, self-stabilizing. Uh, there's generic algorithms around, uh, and that's based on biological systems and social systems. Uh, and basically, they self-optimize for survivability. So it's a pure survivability world. The trouble is, of course, there's no mission here. And we, we, have, we, we not only want survivability, we want other uh, uh, software quality uh, attributes and, 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 and functionality. Um, uh, cooperation without coordination is a very interesting one. Um, one of the problems in distributed systems uh, is that you have communication, and communication has delay, and communication is, a, is, a, is, a, is another place where you can have vulnerabilities. Uh, uh, and mainly communication, if you try to do a, a, um, uh, a centralized algorithm and now move it to a distributed system, what you find is that your execution costs, your, your response time costs, go up dramatically because of all the communication that's going on. In like fact, you may have more costs associated with communication than you do with actually doing the, the, the computations. Um, and <coughs> the way we uh, essentially avoid that is to uh, certainly have cooperation, but not the, 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 the close coordination. So it says, I really don't know who all my neighbors are. Uh, what I do is I make the best use of the information that's available to me at my, at my local node. 
oh, when I find things that might be useful to my neighbors, I pass it on. Uh, I expect them to pass useful information on to me. Um, and this clearly isn't the whole thing, but it's, it's, it's an aspect of our attitude in writing these algorithms. Um, and then there's a, a kind of a holographic view. It says, well, what we're really talking about is, if you know how holograms work, uh, you have a, uh, a film and you shine a light through it and you get a, 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 uh, an image out, um, usually a three-dimensional image. Uh, but it's not that aspect we're talking about. It's the aspect of a holographic image that says, if I now cut a hole in this film, what have I done to the, to the projected image? And the answer is that you've given it a kind of overall degrading, but there's no hole in it. And it's because every pixel in the film corresponds to, to the entire image. And any point in the image corresponds to, to uh, multiple points on the, on the film. And it's that aspect that we want. We want, you to, be, we want to be able to take out components uh, and still have the mission survive. Um, everyday examples. It's really hard to find examples of emerging algorithms in computing systems because basically there, there, there aren't any, or at least have been very, very few. Internet routing, in fact, is, is, is one of the very few that are actually in widespread use. Uh, but in everyday life, we can find things. Flocking of birds. How do birds... How are birds able to fly in flocks and not crash into each other? If you think about it, they, they, they don't have... They don't have uh, uh, central administrative control. There's nobody in charge. They don't even play follow the leader, it turns out. Uh, they, they don't have global visibility. No bird in there can actually see all the other birds. Um, the, um, they certainly get quite close to each other. And so we have to believe that each bird has some very simple algorithm that they're using. <laughs> locally, and that they're in some sense all using the same algorithm even, uh, but uh, and interacting with their neighbors through basically sight for those that, you know, that they can see because they're the, within an angle of, of, of their eyes and, and uh, distance. Uh, but somehow they're getting this emergent property, which in fact is this complex flow of, of, of the flock. Um, how can, you how can you manage your investments when you don't have complete, uh, when, when nobody has administrative control over the financial world and when you don't have complete insight? And you, know, you may be unsuccessful at it, but, <laughs> but, 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 but a lot of the community obviously is successful at it. And in any case, we get an economy out of it. Um, uh, I talked to a few of you, I think, today about how to ants build cemeteries. But the, the, the point there is that at least, at least I'm told is that ants build, uh, uh, they pick up all the dead ants and put them into a single pile. So you have an ant cemetery for all the dead ants. And, and there's a question of, you know, what algorithm does an ant undertaker use? Uh, and, and just think about the most trivial question. How do they decide where the ant cemetery is? You see, I mean, there's, there's, there's it, it, how do these things happen? I'm not going to give you the answer to that one. Uh, how do you avoid running into people on the sidewalk? Uh, you must be using some kind of a local algorithm there. <laughs> uh, uh, species adapting to environments, children learning grammar. Um, you know, how, why, why, aren't, why aren't there multiple of you sitting in the same seat here? Right, but, but it's more than that. It's, it's what algorithm you do these to, to, you know, clearly there must have been two of you looked at the same seat. Why didn't you both try to take it and end up crashing? <laughs> yes, sir. All of your examples are based on, on uh, non threatening situations. There are no malicious. Yes, right. And, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because. Um, absolutely essential <coughs> to what we're talking about, even though I didn't say it. Uh, is the assumption of maliciousness that um, solutions to these sorts of problems are very different if you assume non-malicious. It's the same with security problems.
In fact, that's one of the problems that we have in, in a lot of systems today. I mean, where, where are the vulnerabilities that are actually being attacked on the internet? And as we said earlier, it, it has to do with buffer overflows and timing windows. But why are those buffer overflows and timing windows there? And it's because in the absence of malicious users, the probability of those being problems was extremely low. And so the designers of the system on an individual basis uh, may have even known that there was, there was those vulnerabilities. They didn't care because the probability of anyone running into them was very, very small. It's the way Unix was designed. Uh, and that's all fine and good, but once you get a malicious user, all at once, uh, a malicious user can make rare events or, or events that are likely to be rare uh, become common. And that's, in fact, how uh, incidents on the Internet are perpetuated. So, yes, we assume maliciousness, and it does significantly complicate the problem. <coughs> We're out of time, aren't we? Uh, immersion algorithms, uh, you can think of them as uh, autonomous distributed agents, uh, such that there's sufficiently many of them act as intended the global properties will emerge. And of course we have to refine this as to what we mean by sufficiently many, but uh, we've kind of alluded to that. Um, and as we said, the architectures really have to do with simple local actions plus uh, simple near neighbor interaction. So those are the protocols of interaction. Um, interestingly, in, in trying to come up with emergent algorithms and design such things, we said, what, you know, if I'm trying to solve the at cemetery problem or the internet routing problem or, or uh, whatever it is, how do I do that? Um, how do I think about emergent algorithms? What do I, how does one, what does one do locally to get some global effect? Um, your intuitions are probably as good as mine, which are really bad. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm skilled at it. I've, I've done it, but I, I still don't know how I do it. And so we were looking for some kind of um, methodology for producing reasonable emergent algorithms. And we said one of the things that we know is a constraint is performance. We don't have, we can't have arbitrarily expensive uh, resource costs, whether it's processor cycles or storage or whatever. And so we said, fine, let's just use that constraint. And if you're talking about a network environment, an unbounded network, what kind of local cost can you, can, can, can you afford? And our answer to that was that you cannot afford local uh, costs that are proportional to n, where n is the, the, the total size of the system. So it says, if you get any cost that's n, uh, it's not an acceptable solution. But it turns out that's a very severe constraint. And so all at once, we don't have a big space to search for these algorithms in because we've got this severe constraint, and yet it's a constraint that we believe is inherently necessary. Um, the interesting thing is, in looking at internet routing, is that current internet routing algorithms require space proportional to the size of the network. And so, in fact, this constraint that we feel is, is, is absolutely essential is not being met by current internet routing. That's why people are complaining about having to have gigabyte routing tables. Uh, and it grows just as rapidly as the requirements in your router for tables grows as fast as the internet. Um, okay, so I think that just was, a, that was what I said here. And I'm not going to go into this, but, but here's the, the internet routing algorithm we use. Um, it turns out to be like half a dozen assembly language instructions if you actually implemented it. So it's a simple local algorithm. Uh, it is different than the current routing algorithm, but the significant thing is that um, login cubed is the time for current internet routing, and it's also the time for ours. So they're basically the same order of performance as current internet routing. Uh, but current internet routing is, is n log n in the, uh, in, the, in the size of a table uh, at each node. And uh, for ours, we're at uh, log n cubed, which says we don't have this um, proportional to n size requirement. In fact, if you actually look at the real numbers, uh, this turns out to be um, uh, 100k bytes or something in, in our system for the current internet, which is absolutely tiny. Uh, but it is an emergent algorithm. It does have the properties we're talking about. Um, 
but it doesn't deal with the survivability issues. It deals with writing. And so we still have work to do here. Um, and I'm essentially done, and I guess it's about the right time to be done, right? I, I will mention that um, it's like so many uh, things that happen in research. In trying to, to answer these questions, we said we need some tools to work with. <laughs> That is to say, we can't envision these emergent algorithms. We can't test them because we can't take a network to test them with. Uh, so we need to simulate these algorithms. We need to test them in a simulator. Uh, and that led us to uh, actually designing a, um, a simulation language that, unlike traditional discrete event simulations, is not based on simulating uh, a model programming environment on a unit processor, but rather a multiprocessor environment, but is based on simulating networks, networks where we do not have global visibility, where we do not have centralized control, uh, all these properties we've been talking about. And so we, we are building a language that does have that as its, its basic uh, semantics and uh, uh, constraints on writing programs. And so the idea is that when you simulate a emergent algorithm in this language, that the actual code you would write would would be the same ones that you would write in a, in, a, in a real system, as opposed to simulating by some other algorithm. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, Tim Schimmel was came to CERT last summer and helped me uh, work on a number of experiments related to that language. OK, questions? Yes, sir. Well, uh, I, I, I don't think things are, be, I don't think the things you see emerging out there now are, are particularly addressed at this problem. Uh, on the other hand, I think that we've seen dramatic uh, increase in concern for this class of problem. In fact, for security as well uh, in the commercial world uh, within the last, uh, certainly the last two years, but even, even more so in the last year. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually been quite surprising to me. Um, and there's, there's give some of the evidence of this. If you go back two years, there were like 50 CERT, that is incident response teams around the world. And of those, probably less than a dozen were actually active. The rest of them were there and named, but they weren't funded, they weren't, they weren't thriving. Uh, there's now like somewhere between 70 and 80 of them. Uh, and, and they're almost all active. And that's just happened in the last year. Uh, and that says that, to me, that there's a lot of concern that's being felt with dollars in, in funding and supporting these, these incident response teams. And it's just one, one type of evidence that we can see now about this increased concern. And with the concern, I think we're going to begin to see uh, attempts at solutions, too. <coughs> and that helped. I don't, have, I don't know if that had anything to do with your question, but... <laughs> I was wondering if, you know, if, if, I mean, if, if where the IETF, you know, the Internet Engineering Test, or if, if where they're kind of steering us... Right. I don't, I don't think they're looking at the survivability issues at this point. I know that some of you have to move on to uh, other classes, so at this point I'd like to uh, tell you that next quarter we're planning more lectures. Uh, we're going to be having uh, Captain Meadows from NRL. We're also having someone from the commercial world come in and talk about using directory services for the public infrastructure uh, coming up in April. So um, at this point, I'd like to thank Dr. Fisher for a wonderful talk. And if you have further questions for Anne Kamanyan now, and, and we can discuss them. Thank you.